Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our worship this morning. So glad you're here. I welcome those at our Gaylor campus, those right now who are down at the chapel at our classic service, and our online campus, all of you, hundreds of you that are watching right now on our church online platform, our Facebook Live platform. And of course, if you're watching right now on our Folks Listen TV broadcast, we welcome you and those who are listening live on the Eagle 101.5 FM. We have been on that station now for 10 years live every Sunday morning at 9 o'clock. We welcome all of you. Now obviously here at our Gaylord campus today you're watching me via video and the reason for that is is because today I'm preaching live up at our Sault Ste. Marie campus. And I'll be preaching at 9 o'clock and 10.30 up there. I've tried a couple different times over the past year to sneak away on a Sunday and get up there. Both times things got shut down with COVID. And so I'm excited that this morning I can be up there, see a lot of old friends, meet a lot of new friends. And uh, so it's an exciting time. But this morning at all of our campuses... Gaylor Campus, Sioux Campus, and our online campus, we are starting a brand new series that I'm calling Giving Church a Chance. And this is a series in which we are going to go verse by verse over the next 12 weeks through the book of Colossians. I realize that today the church often gets a bad rap. In fact, I bet almost every one of you know someone who might say something like this, well, I, I follow Jesus, but I'm done with church. Or you know someone who might say, I don't even care about Jesus, and I certainly don't care about the church. The church gets a bad rap, and to be honest, we brought a lot of that on ourselves. But I have some core values about the church. Let me start by sharing two of them with you. I believe, number one, that the local church is the hope of the world. Why? Because we're the only ones God's given us the message that can change someone's eternity. But along with that, I believe that there's nothing like the local church when the local church is working right. And when is the local church working right? The local church is working right when its full focus is on Jesus Christ. That's what the book of Colossians is all about. We're going to learn how to be a church that's working right because our full focus is on Jesus Christ. Now, I want to begin this morning by reading the first eight verses of the book of Colossians. And I want to invite you at our Gaylor campus, down at our chapel service, our online campus, would you stand with me in honor of the Word of God as I read. Now I would encourage you, the book of Colossians is only four chapters long. I encourage you, why don't you try to read it every week over this 12-week series? At the end of the series, you would have read it 12 times. That's a challenge for you. I want to begin by reading the first eight verses, and here's what it says. Colossians 1, beginning in verse number 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. So Timothy is with him where Paul is writing. To the saints and faithful brothers and sisters in Christ who are at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. Now, as we get to verse number three, I want you to note something. From verse three to verse eight, it's all one long run-on sentence. When you start verse 3, you don't hit a period until you get to the end of verse 8. Follow along. We give thanks to God, comma, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, comma, praying always for you, comma, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints, semicolon, because of the hope reserved for you in heaven, Comma, of which you previously heard in the word of truth. Comma, the gospel which has come to you. Comma, just as in all the world also it is bearing fruit and increasing. 
comma, even it has been doing in you also since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth, semicolon, just as you learned it from Epaphras, comma, our, fel- our beloved fellow bondservant, comma, who is a faithful servant of Christ on our behalf, comma, and he also informed us of your love in the spirit, and finally we get to a period. I'm telling you, Paul would have failed my high school English class with Miss Hazlitt, who hated run-on sentences. Well, thank you. You may be seated. Now, I want to divide this today into a couple key sections as we introduce this book. First, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about the author. Then we're going to spend a good chunk of time talking about the audience. And then we're going to spend some closing time talking about the author's admiration for the audience. So let's start by talking about the author. It's very obvious in the text who it is. It's the Apostle Paul. Timothy is with him. Now as Paul writes this, he is under arrest in Rome. He would have been under house arrest. He would have been responsible for funding a little apartment to be in. They didn't have big jails back then. A Roman soldier would have always been with him to ensure he never left the apartment and to be ensure that when it was time for his trial and the emperor called, he would come immediately. And Paul would be allowed visitors during this time. Timothy is there helping to care for him. Paul writes this letter during that time. Now, during that time, he also writes another letter that goes to Colossae. It's the book of Philemon. Then he also writes the book of Philippians during this time, and he writes the book of Ephesians. Now, Ephesians and Colossians are like twins. In fact, one-third of the words in the book of Colossians can be found in the book of Ephesians. They both talk about the church. Ephesians focuses on the body of the church, which is the people, you and I, while Colossians focuses on the head of the church, which is Jesus Christ. Remember, there's nothing like the local church when the local church is working right, and the local church is working right when it's fully focused on Jesus Christ. Christ. So Paul is the author. Now, you want to make sure you make a note of something, and that's this. There is no indication anywhere in the Bible that Paul ever visited Colossae. No indication. If he did, that's not recorded in the Bible. Keep that in the back of your head. Let's look now at the audience. Who is Paul writing to? Now, we're going to break this down into several categories. Number one, we're going to look at the city Then we're going to look at the church. Then we're going to look at the corruption that was taking place. And then we're going to look at the core, the reason for Paul writing this book. Let's start by talking about the city. Now, the city of Colossae is located about 100 miles inland from the city of Ephesus. It's all in the region of that day called Asia Minor. Today we would call it Turkey. And Ephesus is the capital city. Ephesus is a port city. It is a very important city. Colossae is located 100 miles inland. Now that's going to be important in just a minute, so tuck that away. Colossae is located in what's called the Lycus Valley, a beautiful valley. And there's main trade routes that go through it east to west and north to south. And with the city of Colossae, there are two other key cities that are all located right together. You've heard of the twin cities, Minneapolis and St. Paul. This would be the trilogy of cities. You have Colossae. Then you have a city called Laodicea. You should be familiar with that. It's one of the churches that Jesus writes to in the book of Revelation. And then you have another city called Hierapolis. And and these cities are located really within 12 miles of Colossae. They're all clustered right together in the Lycus Valley. Now at one time, Colossae was a very prominent city. 500 years before Paul writes this letter, it was a very important city. It was known for its black wool. However, As time went on, that city began to deteriorate. 
by the time we get to Paul's writing, this city is relatively insignificant. In fact, it's really a has-been city by that time. Now, if you go to the Lycus Valley today, you can see the excavated ruins of Laodicea. You can see the excavated ruins of Hierapolis. But you will find very few stones excavated from Colossae. It was primarily a Gentile city, but there was a fair number of Jews that also lived there. Now, how did the church get started in Colossae? Well, I already told you. Paul did not start the church there. There's no indication that Paul ever visited there. But he did have an indirect hand in the starting of this church. Let me explain how. Remember, Paul takes three missionary journeys. At the end of his third journey, Paul will spend three years in the city of Ephesus. That's why I told you earlier, you must remember the city of Ephesus. Colossae is a hundred miles inland. Now, during the three years that he's in Ephesus, for a while, he preaches daily in the synagogue until they shut him down. The final two years, he preaches in a more Gentile area, a Greek area, and the Bible teaches us that as he preached there, the gospel went throughout all of Asia Minor. Let me read it to you. It's found in the book of Acts, chapter 19, beginning in verse number 8. Here's what it says. And Paul entered the synagogue. This is in Ephesus. He continued speaking out boldly for three months, having discussions and persuading the Jews about the kingdom of God. But when some of those Jews were becoming hardened and disobedient, speaking evil of the way, and that's what they called Christians in that day, before the people, Paul withdrew from them to the school of Tyrannus, there in the school of Tyrannus, for two years, he would preach daily. And here's what it says happened as a result. So that all who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. I find this amazing. Over the three journeys, God sends Paul to the world. But at the end of the third journey, Paul's just going to stay put in Ephesus, preaching daily, and God's going to bring the world to Paul. And that's what happens. All who live in Asia Minor, many, many, many of them would have need to go to Ephesus, that major capital city, that port city. And when they would come to Ephesus, God would set up divine appointments and they would hear Paul preach and the gospel began to spread all throughout Asia Minor. Now it just makes sense, doesn't it? That there would be some people from Colossae who would have visited Ephesus during that time and were introduced to one of them. His name is Epaphras. Now, we're going to see Epaphras in the book of Colossians, and he will be an absolute unsung hero of the faith. Many Christians have no idea who he is. But his commitment to Christ in the church is amazing. And in chapter 1, down in verse number 7, it says this. Just as you, the church of Colossae, learned it, the gospel, from who? From Epaphras, our beloved fellow bondservant, who's a faithful servant of Christ on our behalf, he also informed us of your love in the Spirit. So how did this church in Colossae get started? Well, it appears that one day Epaphras had to go to Ephesus. And in Ephesus, God set up a divine appointment. Epaphras hears Paul preach, perhaps gets to talk to Paul one-on-one, -on -one, and Epaphras gets saved. He puts his faith in the death and resurrection of Christ. He goes back to Colossae, and he starts a church. And I think he started one in Laodicea, and I think he started one in Hierapolis as well. That's how this church begins. Now, how do we go from that to the writing of this letter. Well, as time passes, Paul is now in prison in Rome under house arrest. Rome is about 1,000 miles from Colossae. 
But something is happening in Colossae that is threatening this church. And Epaphras is greatly concerned. In fact, we'll learn later in the book that he literally agonizes in prayer for the church at Colossae. He's so concerned, he makes the 1,000 mile trip to Rome where he updates Paul. He tells Paul some good things about the church, but he also tells Paul some dangers regarding the church. And after he leaves and goes back home, Paul is going to write this letter to the church of Colossae. At the same time, he'll write the letter of Philemon, who was part of the church of Colossae. And through a messenger named Tychicus, both of these letters will be delivered to the church at Colossae. Now, what we have to do is spend some time talking about what was it that got Epaphras so concerned about the church that he would make that 1,000-mile trip to talk to Paul. So we're going to call this the corruption. We've seen the city. We've seen the church. Now, notice the corruption. There was a false teaching taking place in the city of Colossae, and it was infiltrating the church. Now, you can't really identify one exact false teaching that it was. It seemed to be a hybrid of false teachings, kind of like the goulash of false teachings, the mutt of false teachings. Because you see, so many people pass through Colossae on these trade routes that little bits and pieces of all kinds of religions began to settle in the town. And what was happening is that these corruptions, these false teachings, were now finding their way into the church. That's what Paul will address. Now, what I want to do to kind of simply explain to you what the corruption was is to just put it into two arms. The first arm will be a philosophical false teaching. The second arm will be a legalistic false teaching. Both of them will attack the sufficiency of Jesus Christ. So first of all, there is a philosophical false teaching. This became the seed of what was later known as Gnosticism. The word Gnosticism comes from the word that means knowledge because you see, this false teaching said this. It said, it's great that you have Jesus, but Jesus isn't enough. Along with Jesus, for you to have salvation, you must attain this higher secret knowledge. A knowledge revealed through visions and dreams. And if you don't have this knowledge, you don't really have salvation because Jesus isn't enough. In fact, this philosophical false teaching basically said this, God is good, but all of matter, everything on earth, including us, everything is evil. So God could not have created the world or us because we're all evil. Here's what God did. God created what they called emanations. It's really different levels of spirit beings. One of the higher levels was Jesus. He was an emanation of God. But there were many emanations below Jesus and one lower emanation kind of went rogue and it created matter which was evil. It created people which were evil and for people to get to God, they had to work their way through these levels of emanations. Jesus being just one of them. Think of it kind of like a video game where you have to win this level to go to the next level to go to the next level. That's what they taught. As a result of that, angel worship became a major element of this philosophical false teaching. And they denied that Jesus was ever born a man because Jesus could not be born a man because man is evil. They denied the sufficiency of Christ. Jesus isn't enough, they would say. In fact, here was their formula. Ready? Their formula said this. It's Jesus plus knowledge that equals salvation. It's great that you have Jesus, 
but he's not enough. You must work your way through these levels of emanations. You must get this secret knowledge until you arrive at God. That was one angle of the corruption in the city that was infiltrating the church. The other angle is what we'll call a legalistic false teaching. Now, this legalistic false teaching probably had its roots in Judaism. And it said that there were certain things you must do. In other words, it was great that you believed in Jesus. Jesus is good, but Jesus isn't enough. They would say this, for you to be saved, you must also be circumcised. For you to be saved, you must also observe certain dietary laws. For you to be saved, you must observe certain festivals and worship on certain days. That was the legalistic branch. They taught a rigid self-denial. They taught a harsh treatment of the body. In the same way that the philosophical arm said, Jesus isn't enough, you need Jesus plus knowledge to equal salvation. The legalistic arm said this, Jesus is good, but he's not enough. You need Jesus plus works to equal salvation. So both arms of this false teaching really struck at the heart of the sufficiency of Christ. Both arms said, Jesus isn't enough. One arm said, you also need knowledge. One arm said, you also need works. And this was not just in the city now. It was infiltrating the church. And Epaphras was so concerned that he made the 1,000 mile trip to Rome to talk to Paul about this danger. Now that brings us to the core. We've seen the city, we've seen the church, we've seen the corruption. But now we see the core. Why does Paul write this book? Well, Paul writes it to address these philosophical and legalistic false teachings. And we'll see that as we go through the book together. Now, the theme of the book, very simply put, is this. The sufficiency and the supremacy of Jesus Christ. While these false teachings said Jesus wasn't enough, Paul writes this amazing four-chapter letter to say, folks, listen, Jesus is enough. This whole letter is about the supremacy and the sufficiency of Jesus. Remember, there's nothing like the local church when the local church is working right and the local church is working right when its full focus is on Jesus Christ. Well, that's just the first two verses. Now, let's spend just a few minutes tackling this long run-on sentence. Verses 3 down through verse 8. We really already said 7 and 8 talking about Epaphras. So verses 3 through 6 become the key now. And we're going to call it the admiration. We've seen the author. We've seen the audience. Now the admiration. You see, before Paul gets to the doctrinal part of his letter, He wants to share some personal thoughts with this church. Because when Epaphras came to talk to Paul about the church, yes, he told Paul about the danger, but he also told Paul about the good qualities of this little church in Colossae. So let me again read verses 3 through 6, then let me give you some points. Paul says we, that would be him and Timothy, We give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Now, that doesn't mean they were always praying. The Greek grammar would be that when they were praying, they were always giving thanks. And why are they giving thanks? Since we heard of your... Now, wait a second. How did they hear? Through Epaphras, remember? He went to Rome. He told Paul. Now, what were the good qualities he told Paul about? Now, if you have a pen, get ready to mark these three words. There are three key words. Ready? We give thanks because Epaphras told us about, number one, your faith in Christ Jesus. And I would circle the word faith. Number two, he told us about the love which you have for all the saints. And I would circle the word love. And then he says, you have these because of the Hope reserved for you in heaven. And I would circle the word hope. Faith, love, hope. 
of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel which came to you. And how did the gospel come to them? Through Epaphras. Just as in all of the world also, it's bearing fruit. It's increasing. Others are coming to Jesus, even as it has been doing in you also since the day you heard it from Epaphras. And now your church is growing and because you have understood the grace, and I would circle that word, of God in truth. All right, let's break it down. So when Paul prays for the church at Colossae, he does so giving thanks for three things. Number one, Epaphras told me about your faith in Jesus Christ. And ladies and gentlemen, that's where belonging to the church begins. Becoming part of the church universal of Jesus Christ happens when I put my faith in the fact that Christ died for my sin, paying my penalty in full, and that he rose again the third day. It all is founded on a faith in Jesus Christ. Not a faith in Jesus plus knowledge, not a faith in Jesus plus works, but a faith in Jesus alone. And when that takes place, what does it result in? Along with faith in Christ, there is a love for the saints. And notice it says in the text, it's a love for all the saints, not just some of the saints. And this is a word love that describes self-sacrificial love, a love that's willing to serve others. And it says you have a love that's willing to serve all the saints. You see, those that were propagating these false teachings, they only loved those who were on their level. But in the real church, they were loving all believers, even those who got on their nerves. And we all have them. I hope you're not pointing at anybody, but we all have them. It's like a family. Everyone in this room, everyone watching our online campus, watching down at the chapel, every one of you in your family, you have that one person, that one family member who gets on your nerves, who you always hope doesn't come to Thanksgiving dinner, right? Right? but you still choose to love them. Why? Because they're part of the family. And Epaphras said, Paul, this church in Colossae, they honestly, truly, sacrificially love each other. So he is thankful for their faith in Christ. He's thankful for their love for the saints. And he's thankful for their hope of eternity. They have these things because of the hope reserved for them in heaven. The hope of eternal life. That's what motivates them. It's not the things of this world that motivates them. It's knowing what they have in heaven that motivates them. You see, we live in a world today that does this. They put all of their efforts in the present and they sacrifice the future for the present. You know what a true Christian does? He's willing to sacrifice the present for the future. He's willing to say no to worldly pleasures today because he knows there's something better reserved for him in heaven. And that was the mindset of this church. They had a faith in Christ. They had a love for the saints. They had a hope for eternity. Now, by the way, that is a very important trilogy to Paul. Faith, love, hope. He uses it often. Let me read you a couple verses. 1 Corinthians 13, 13. But now abides faith, hope, and love. These three, but the greatest is love. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3. Constantly keeping in mind your work of faith and your labor of love and your perseverance of hope. We see it again. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 8, we see it again. But since we are of the day, let's be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith, and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. We see it over and over and over again. Now, I started the message by telling you that two of my core values about the church is number one, the local church is the hope of the world. And number two, 
There's nothing like the local church when the local church is working right. Can I give you a third one? I believe this with every fiber of my being. It's another core value I have about the church, and it's this. That the best days of the local church are still ahead. That's why I cannot give up on the church. Even when the church makes mistakes, even when the church causes me hurt, I cannot give up on the church. Why? Because I still believe it's the hope of the world. I still believe there's nothing like the local church when the local church is working right. And I am convinced that the best days of the local church are still ahead. So Paul says, we give you thanks to God for you. Now, those three elements, faith, hope, and love, he says in that passage, they came to you through hearing the gospel. You heard the gospel of truth. They heard it through Epaphras. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And what was the result of hearing it? He said, it bore fruit. It's increasing. It's increasing in the world. It's increasing in Colossae. He's talking about more converts, more people coming to know Jesus Christ. How do you know a healthy church? A healthy church will be a church that's seeing other people come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. It was so exciting last weekend, Easter weekend. Not only through our Gaylor campus, our Sioux campus, and our online campus did God give us the largest attendance in the history of our church. But we had 234 people between our services and our TV broadcast that texted us saying they had made some kind of decision for Jesus Christ. We are following up on every one of them. They're getting seven different emails, seven touches, seven encouragements to take next steps. My friend, that is a sign of a healthy church. Evangelism must be the engine that drives the church. That's another core value I have about the church. Evangelism must be the engine that drives the church. But notice one more thing. Notice how he ends with another key word. We saw faith, we saw love, we saw hope. The other key word is grace. He said, you understood the grace of God in truth. Now, why is this important? Here's why. Because one arm of this corruption was saying Jesus isn't enough. It's Jesus plus knowledge. Another end arm of this corruption was saying Jesus isn't enough. It's Jesus plus works. And Paul's reminding us of something very important. He's reminding us that our salvation doesn't come through knowledge. It doesn't come through works. It comes through grace. God giving to us what we don't deserve. Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, so that no man can boast. You see, my friends, one arm of this corruption in Colossae that was seeping into the church said, it's Jesus is good, but he's not enough. It is Jesus plus knowledge that equals salvation. Another arm of this corruption that was seeping into the church said, Jesus is good, but he's not enough. It's Jesus plus works that equals salvation. Do you know what Paul is saying in the book of Colossians? He's saying both of those are wrong. Don't buy into it. Don't go that direction. Paul says, let me give you the real formula. The real formula is this. It's not Jesus plus knowledge equals salvation. It's not Jesus plus works equals salvation. The real formula is this. It's Jesus plus nothing that equals salvation. This book is all about the supremacy and sufficiency of Jesus Christ. There is nothing like the local church when the local church is working right and the local church is working right when its full focus is on the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me end with this. I remember being in a a conversation one time with someone, a skeptic, and they made this statement. It was an emphatic statement. They said to me, I feel sorry for you Christians. I said, really, why? And here's what he said. I feel sorry for you Christians 
Because all you have is Jesus. All you have is Jesus. My friend, can I just end with this statement? If you have Jesus, you have it all. And that's what the book of Colossians is all about. There's nothing like the local church when the local church is working right. And the local church is working right when it's fully focused on Jesus. Because it's Jesus plus nothing that equals salvation. If you have Jesus, you, my friend, have it all. Would you stand with me for prayer? And Father, I'm so thankful for this amazing book, the book of Colossians. I'm so thankful that over the next 12 weeks, we're going to be able to really build on the beauty of the church and see why we need to give the church a chance. We're going to discover together that there's nothing like the local church when the local church is working right and the local church is working right when Jesus is its full focus. May Jesus be our full focus here at E-Free Church because if we have Jesus, we have it all. And I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks for being with us today. We're going to now close our time in some worship. Let's worship the Lord together.